Welcome to the latest edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime with me, Marshan and Kenny. Well, this is episode 42 and I've done a lot of football interviews. I've had a lot of big name coaches on the show that you recognize. I've had a lot of big name players on the show that you recognize. But one avenue of football I haven't touched on yet are the special teams. So I thought it was time to give the kicker some love and one of the best to ever do it as my interview today. And that's Luke Johnson, a former All-American. I know it's going to be an interview you're going to absolutely love. Well, we had some big news in the Southern Miss football world this week. We hired a new offensive coordinator in Chip Long, and we hired a new, de a new defensive coordinator in Clay Bignell. So hopefully that pumps some new life into this program after a 3-9 and nine season because 2024 is going to be such a key year for Coach Will Hall and where this program is headed. So I love the fan comments portion of this show. And normally I ask you all a question that you answer, but I thought I would change it up this week. So I asked you to ask me any questions that you saw fit for me to answer. And we'll get into some of those answers that I had in this next segment that we call Four and Out. Someone asked, can you give me a story from under the pile? Well, I quickly think of a game, 1995 at Indiana. I had 22 tackles that game. My body was a little beat up, and I was tired of tackling Hoosiers in the second half. So one play ended, and what do you know? I'm stuck under a pile, and, and while I'm under that pile waiting for them to get off of me, uh, a Hoosier helmet a guy was right there next to me, and he couldn't tell who was doing this. So I'm like, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity to hurt a Hoosier. So I took my two fingers under his face mask and jammed it up his nose as far as I could. And he was just screaming, huh, nasally, and oh, who's done? And I'm just jamming it. And as I started feeling the pile come off of me, I quickly removed my fingers, and Paul, Paul got off, and I got up and quickly turned to get the next play from a defensive coordinator, got the signal in, and He's over there screaming, who did that? Who did that? And, you know, I'm acting like nothing happened because, you know, next play. I mean, who would do something like that? Next up, I had a question of what team did you hate the most and why is it Louisville? I think this person might know a little bit about me, but Louisville. So two examples of why it might be Louisville. Louisville, 1997 home game at the Rock my senior year. I just hated Louisville. I thought they were pompous and arrogant and their fans thought they were better than everybody is what I've just really felt deep down inside. So I went to the Rock that day. I didn't worry about tackling. I was worried about fighting. So it, early in the first half, I made a tackle behind the line and the whistle blew, but I, I took the tackle way longer than the play should have because the play was over and kept driving this guy, driving this guy. I got an unsportsmanlike conduct from the ref. Well, didn't learn my lesson. A few plays later, I'm still a little ticked off there to fight. And I'm having some really choice words with the entire offensive line. And, and before I knew it, my defensive coordinator, John Thompson, screaming, get out the game, get out the game. And I had to listen to him because I respected him. Told me to stand next to him for a couple plays and calm my ass down before I got thrown out of the game. But just it's funny you did pick Louisville and I, I, I just really just wasn't a fan of them from their arrogance. And also 1996, a road game with them. One more example where I spent four quarters having really nice words with hundreds of their fans. So, but yeah, Louisville, great choice on why I might've hated them the most. And then somebody asked, who are the coolest fans you, you went against or, or, or played at their stadium in college? And that's easy for me. It was East Carolina. I mean, I thought their fan base size of their squad and, and and just everything they were doing were kind of mirror images away of us and uh it was an incredible atmosphere i mean I, I just really looked forward to playing at east carolina i mean kudos to them i wish they'd someday get in the sun belt that'd be a lot of fun and then finally somebody asked what was the moment that really drew you into southern miss athletics well it might be a little bit of a surprise to you it was actually a fight and that was in 1993, my red shirt year was preseason, and it was a week before we were kicking off the season. I was on the scout team, and a scrimmage at the Rock had the scout team offense versus the scout team defense, and we were trying to prove a point on why she would, 
we should be on this team and, and, and start one day. So it was a lot of attitude, a lot of intensity. And what that added up to is within five plays of a bunch of type A personalities, really within five plays, a melee broke out. I mean, it was just a brawl from one side of the stadium to the other to the point. Went on for about five minutes and and Coach Bauer and the staff decided to cancel the scrimmage. And uh, but but why a fight, you ask, might be where you really started getting Southern Miss in your soul. Well, after the fight, we're all in the locker room. And I tell you what, it was almost like brothers laughing about everything that happened. And we couldn't stop talking about the stories and just everything that happened there. And it's it just amazing. You know, you'll even hear that in families from brothers when they fight. You know, it just makes them a lot closer. That's just competitive spirit. But it built a lot of love, a lot of respect and what have you, especially the ones that were fighting really hard and uh, that day. And, uh, but it just added for fun. And it all culminated with some brotherhood, some family type relationships that ended in 1997 with that big Liberty Bowl win. So once again, thanks for all the questions that you sent to me. And hopefully you liked all my answers and some of my stories right there. Well, once again, I thought it's time for this show to show the kicker some love. So I definitely picked one of the best to ever do it at Southern Miss, and he's an absolute fan favorite. So today's interview is with all-American punter from Southern Miss, Luke Johnson. I thought it's about time to give the punter some love, so why not bring in one of the best to ever do it in the black and gold, a guy who was an all-American, all-conference and team captain guy his senior year. I mean, just all everything at Southern Miss while he was there. So with all that said, a big fan favorite is the interview today, Luke Johnson. And Luke, how you doing, man? Hey, Marshant. Thanks for uh, come, letting me come on, man. It's an honor for the invite, and, and I look forward to talking Southern Miss with you and reliving some memories. And a lot of a lot of people don't know, you know, you and I talk a lot, and, and we, uh, we talk a lot uh, just through text and the phone, so I'm glad we actually – Maybe a little scary for us to actually be recorded talking together, but it'll be fun. <laughs> well, no, we communicate all the time, and, and this year was a roller coaster of emotions. You trying to keep me up, you know? And I'm like, but Luke, man, we're three and nine, man. You're like, you know, we'll make, it'll be okay, Marsha. <laughs> so, but we do text all the time. But it's time to tell your story because, like I said, I just don't think punters get enough love. You're the one, one of the best to ever do it in the black and gold, and. I'm not making it a secret. You got my vote for the Hall of Fame. So why don't punters get more love, Luke? Tell me. We're the one position that uh, nobody wants to watch play. You know, there's been a lot of my former teammates and people who said, hey, man, if you play a lot, that means, you know, the offense is stinking it up. And so, you know, we, we take pride in the fact that if we don't play, the team's usually doing pretty well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's one of those roles that um, it, it you have a place on the football field and a place on the team. And, when you're called upon, uh, you, you've you got to execute. And I think a lot of people um, that they're just casual fans of football don't realize how much field position goes um, into how it switches momentum. And you being a former defensive guy, you know, there's a whole lot a whole lot of difference when you got them backed up inside the 10 versus starting on the plus side of the field. So, yeah, I think sometimes punter is, uh, punters are, are those guys where you take it for granted when you've got a good one and when you don't have a good one or, uh, or he's having a bad day, it's really noticeable. Yeah, and you and I are Jeff Bauer guys. I mean, coached by him, and, you know, I, I, I can speak 100% on how Coach Bauer treated special teams. It was special teams, offense, defense, all on the same level, not one more important than the other. And field position is everything. It is everything. And, Luke, you were some of the best to set up uh, the defense in some good spots, so always respect to you, man. But and, and speaking of respect to you, people just love you in the Southern Miss world, and we're getting all the football stuff. But, man, you were the co-host of the world-famous Eagle Hour. Your co-host with Bob Getty and Kelly Sander, my guys. And how much fun has that been for you? It's been fun um, because, you know, to start with, I'm not a, a journalistic uh, professional or major, you know, like both of those guys. Of course, um, they were both sports directors at WDAM for a long time and have really done journalism their whole life. So uh, Kelly actually was the third one that came in. Jim Taylor, the famous Jim Taylor, beat Alabama in the 1990 game, played with Brett Favre and, you know, those uh, for Curly Hallman. He was actually the the the, uh, the initial co-host with Bob. And then 
Uh, when he moved from the Laurel area, he became pastor at First Baptist McGee. I had kind of just been, you know, filling in when somebody couldn't do that, and they would have me on occasionally. And Bob asked me to come on, and man, I can't remember. It was six or seven years ago, and so probably probably three or four years ago, Santer uh, would make these appearances, and then he just came on board full time with us. And it is it's funny, and uh, you know, we were joking off air. There is a generational gap. There will be references um, to musicians and TV shows from like the 1950s and I just go silent or I will crack some joke about how old they are. The other day uh, we had Peter Bain, another former Southern Miss uh, punter and he was on and, and I just told Peter, I was thankful somebody under the age of 45 was on the show. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I think, I think I, I think I really said 65, but yeah, it it's you, you learn from those guys um, because they've done it so long and uh they they had some great interviews over the years. And so, you know, me just kind of being a guy, I didn't know what I was doing and just kind of learning, but but looking, you know, to those guys and about, uh, you know, how to ask questions and how to interview and how to fill guests out. And, you know, you just kind of, you, you take on those things, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but they've always been very gracious with me. And uh, Bob, especially, um, you know, with, we'll, we'll talk a little more about what my life looks like. Uh, he's always very gracious, you know, to, to let the priorities of my life, um, you know, stand out. And when I have to miss, you know, episodes or shows or, or whatever, he's very good to do that. But Kelly's a riot, man. Um, a lot of people don't know this. If we're live on set somewhere, most of the time, most of the days in the studios, he will uh, do his Dixie Darlings. Uh, he'll do the Dixie Darlings to come on the air. And when we've had former Dixie Darlings on, they always get him on his, uh, his elbow height and the fact that his thumbs, I think thumbs have to actually be up or to be proper <laughs> protocol. But yeah, most of the time he does that. And you never know what's going to come out of Santa. And so sometimes you just shake your head. Sometimes you laugh. Sometimes you just get up and walk away. Man, I, I love Kelly Santa. And, and you guys have had me on several times, which is always a blast. But every time I'm coming on, I'll ask you or Bob, I mean, is Kelly going to be on? Because I know I got to be on my toes. Because some kind of questions coming from left field. But but all jokes aside, man, you guys are, are the best resource for daily information of Southern Miss Athletics you got out there. You guys do an incredible job with a lot of entertainment despite the generational gap. So <laughs> it's, it's fun. And, you know, it's, it's a mix. Um, we don't claim to be exclusive by any means. There's a whole lot of great podcasts. And the kind of the way that we've approached it is anybody that covers the Golden Eagles, like, we're, we're their fan. We're their supporter. Just because we have a daily platform through Super Talk Mississippi that we're able to go on, you know, we always want to we, – we never want to come across – I think sometimes people can come across as, like, pompous and just because you have a microphone and that's stupid. And the very fact is if somebody wants to take time out and wants to cheer for the Golden Eagles and wants to report on the Golden Eagles and wants to talk about the Golden Eagles, man, I'm, I'm their number one fan because uh, the more coverage we have – not not just for the university, but it's dudes like you and me that that put on the pads that that know about it. I want those guys to be in the spotlight, and I want people to know their names, where they come from, their communities, and when they do good things on the field, you know, I, I want people to know about it. And so, the more the more shows, the more podcasts uh, that we have, the, the the better. I'm just thankful, you know, for this season in my life. Um, you know, that I get to talk about Southern Miss on a daily basis. Pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, you aren't even whistling Dixie, man. You're telling the truth. Before I launched my show, you guys had me on so I can promote my show a little bit. So the facts, you know, me, and uh, I'm not an X's and O's show. I can never compete with you guys. I'm more storytelling. So let's get to the story of Luke Johnson right now. So when did you know hunting was going to be your forte before Southern Miss? So, in, in my dad, when I was like fourth grade, he built me a, a soccer goal and he put uprights on it. And he challenged me. He says, I want you, it's probably early than that, it's probably second grade. He said, I want you to be able to kick a 40 yard field goal by the time you're in fourth grade. And it didn't happen. It happened when I was in sixth grade. But I would, I would get a tee and I would kick in the backyard, Just kick, 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 kick. So, my mom would let me play organized football till eighth grade. And, um, I didn't do much, and uh, I was actually like a tackle. I just I was just on the squad at West Jones. So ninth grade, I go to go play quarterback. Uh, I'm I'm kicking and punting at, at this time, and then in high school, I really excelled at West Jones as a quarterback, uh, primarily as a kicker and punter. But I did play quarterback, um, and uh, I, I tore my ACL my senior year, second game of my senior year, and so kind of all the scholarships went off, and it really became I could have played tight end and punted at the Naval Academy 
or Mississippi College. I could have played baseball or or and football at Jones College. I could have walked on at Southern Miss. I had a couple like Ivy Leagues that that wanted me to to possibly play football, um, but I decided to walk on at Southern Miss. Uh, just praying through it and getting good, good wisdom on it. And uh, I've I've always been a Golden Eagle. Um, I may talk about this a little later, but I have a shirt from 1990 when I became a junior eagle at age seven until I graduated high school. It's it's my junior eagle shirt, uh, so it's like an extra extra small, and it has basically every good player from Southern Miss from 1990 to 2000, including the host of this show right now. I, I'm, I'm on, on that, man. I signed that. You're on there. Wow. You're on That's there. That's awesome. And so, and so that was growing up, you know, in the rock. And I was joking the other day with my wife on the, on the west side. They've got the old school like uh, chair backs. Me and my dad would sit two bleachers above there. And by the second quarter, if nobody was sitting in there, we'd sneak down and sit in the chair backs. But I mean, I grew up going to the rock, you know. And so when I walked on at Southern Miss, a lot of ways it was a dream come true. And uh, Chad O'Shea was with the Cleveland Browns now. He was my special teams coordinator. And we had kickers, uh, but the only punter we, we had was Hallman. And he called me in um, kind of after my true freshman year because I was kicking and punting. And he said, hey, if you want to play, you need to you need to work on your punting. And that's what needs to be your ticket. And so, yeah, backed up Hallman um, in 2002 and, and then became a three-year starter. So it just kind of – I thought I was going to kick. I was a much better kicker than I was a punter um, in high school. And it was just something I had to learn. And it was the way to, to get on the field and contribute. So that's what I did. Yeah, and, and before we get into your pretty awesome career of kicking that ball, man, let, let's talk real quick in that 01 and 02 season before you became a starter in 03, your red shirt and freshman year. Man, tell people who may not understand what the vibe of Southern Miss football was back then. The first vibe was we still had Vegas gold. And the second I love that. vibe was – Thank you. Thank you. I love that gold. I love that we gold. still had the attack eagle. <laughs> and we still had the little Southern Miss right here, you know, the we had Nike jerseys. And so I came in, we were coming off the 2000 season where, you know, we got in the, in the teens, uh, faded a tad down the stretch, lost at Cincinnati. So Coach Bauer never let us wear all whites the entire time I was there because they lost that game. But, yeah, I mean, you come in and you still got guys on the team like Chad Williams. Um, you know, of course, Jeff's there. Um, Kenny Johnson's there. You know, guys on uh, Roy McGee's there. You know, some of those guys, some of those freshman linebackers. Um, of course, you know, Rod's a, a redshirt or a redshirt freshman on on that team, um, or a, a true sophomore on that team. So, and and D Nix. I mean, D Nix is is your guy. So there was I was connected to Liberty Bowl '99. I was connected to um, you know the the crazy good defenses that that we had. I was connected to all that. And so Jeff Kelly being a senior um, and, you know, some of the leadership that, that he showed. And then uh, the 02 season, um, well, 01, we beat Les Miles in Oklahoma. So Oklahoma State at home to start the season. The next season we beat the defending um, Big Ten champs, Illinois, in the Rock. That was a early that's, – that's the game that Denix, you know, he got hurt and, uh, and then had a really tough time coming back. But I was to, to me was being on that now look back on it, I was connected to some of the best Southern Miss teams that, that ever were um in those 01 and 02 teams. And I think anybody oh one we didn't go to a bowl game, which was crazy. Uh we lost to TCU in the last game of the season. But the 02 team, there was so much NFL talent on that team. And had D Nix, you know, probably not gotten hurt, we would have we would have played a whole lot. Uh we would have probably won some more down the stretch. You got to go to a bowl game. So for me, it was those first two seasons. What I had watched Southern Miss in the 90s, I got to actually take part of just that in a reserve role. Oh, a great way to put in some of the names you put right there. Derek Nix, I mean, geez, the baby bull. Wow, what what an incredible running back we had. And, and I've gone on there saying my favorite football player in the black and gold I've ever watched was Rod Davis. Man, that's my guy. I used to love watching Rod. So, I mean, what a hard hitter. But, yeah, thanks for giving a vibe of what Southern Miss football was like back then. But if anybody knows you, Luke, and anybody that doesn't, Watching this, I mean, Luke is a good man. They just don't make people better than Luke Johnson. And in 2002, you're 19 years old. You get ordained as a minister, as a Baptist minister. I mean, what what drew you to the faith? And, and I picture that as a lot of work at 19 years old to balance all that, man. I mean, how'd you handle all that? 
So um, I was raised in a in a family that uh, that read the Bible, uh, that that prayed, that that took me um, to to meet with God's people and worship every week. But it wasn't until I was a week before my fifteenth birthday when everything just kind of clicked. The best way I can explain it is like a light switch came on, and I just realized that I was in need of Christ. I was a sinner, and you know, even though I was religious, that's not going to save anybody, make anybody right with God. And, so, you know, uh, through through the scriptures, came to realize that I needed a Savior, I needed Christ. And so a week before my 15th birthday is uh, where, you know, to put in your terms, you know, that's when, that's when Luke Johnson was recreated. That's when I became a new creation in Christ. And the scripture says, if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And that's when I was born again. I mean, it's where my life changed. And um, and so what was, what was freeing about it in, in junior high and then in high school when I got athletic success, my identity wasn't really in my performance. I mean, even though I was a all state in football and, and baseball, like I didn't find myself being wrapped up in, you know, I'm better or worse based off what I do. And so when I went to college, my identity wasn't in the fact that I was a football player, which is really funny. You you probably have felt this as well. You're like, oh yeah, I gotta go to practice today. You know, oh well, yeah, we're, we're in the top 25. I gotta go. You know, it's just sometimes you it's because it's a daily routine, you forget about it. But I mean, for me, it was my identity wasn't wrapped up in the fact that that I played college football. So back in high school when I was a junior, um, going into my junior year, been praying about like, you know, what I want to do in life and, if, you know, college major stuff. And uh, I mean, it's a pretty surreal moment. I just kind of just really was impressed by the Lord. Um, just, hey, you're going to do ministry of some sort. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what it meant. But it was just basically me like writing a blank check, just being like, Lord, like, here's my life, whatever you want to do with it. And so when I graduated West Jones on Tuesday, on a, on a Tuesday in 2001 in May, that Sunday, I started serving a local church in Ellisville, just kind of like as a summer intern, uh, it was Pine Grove Baptist church. And I was just, you know, working with, uh, high school students and, and middle school students, just teaching the Bible and teaching Sunday school and stuff. So that turned into like a two and a half year gig, which was cool. Um, one time we played Louisville in O2, uh, on a Thursday night. And so, you know, how the night before, you know, you go to, we would go to Turtle Creek and watch a movie and then take us to the hotel. Well, I had to like preach that night at church. So Coach Bauer just like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Like, I don't think anybody, very few people, he's like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Just get somebody to drop you off at the hotel. So I went and preached at, at church. And then, you know, I was like, oh, I can't, then rush your freshman. Like he really trusts me. It was a cool moment. But, um, so yeah, I started, I, I started serving a local church into my, my home, my home church pastor, um, he had recognized my call to ministry and my church had recognized my call to ministry. And so, yeah, it was, uh, my red shirt freshman spring. Um, I was ordained by, by my, by my local church. Now, what was, what was funny was a week, a week earlier, um, in the spring game, Southern Miss spring game, we had a bad snap. And so I took off and the returner took me out after I'd run like 30 yards down the field. And he like, it tore, it partially tore my MCL. Matt Smith was still there you know, got me in a Bledsoe brace. And so when I was ordained, I was wearing this long Bledsoe brace like over my khakis. And so these men were coming by and they were laying hands on me, you know, just Lord bless Luke in his ministry and, you know, bless him. And they would just hug me and pray over me. But one guy I totally forgot that I had a knee injury and he was like praying over me, like kick my leg. And I was like, oh yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I realized that that's what I was supposed to do. And um, as my as my career at Southern Miss continued, um, I, I I was at that church for a little over two and a half years, uh, a little over yeah, a little over two two years and three months or so, and then I transitioned to where I just started traveling a lot and speaking and preaching different places. And Coach Bauer, like you know, I mean, if I had an, an event and I needed to leave practice a little early, he let me out of it. And we can talk about this more in a little bit, but he he let me he let me miss a summer work an entire summer of workouts because I went to Africa as a short term missionary. Co and, Coach uh, Bauer, the Coach Bauer I know, he I did. You he must did. be deep in the faith then, Luke. He did. Coach Bob. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that, that all started when I was when I was 19. And, um, you know, to, and and I was able to, you know, to minister to dudes on the team. And, and I continue to this day, you know, to serve the Lord in ministry. Oh, that's that's awesome, man. Like, like I said, just a good dude on the field, good dude off the field. That'll make him better than you. And, and kind of proof with those stories, the Lord works in mysterious ways with the MCL and still being ordained and, and you hear it all the time. It's proof with a guy like Luke Johnson, the good Lord, does love the Golden Eagles, man. No doubt about it. So, well, I always, always say, I, 
sometimes when I'm going places and, you know, they introduce me as former Southern Miss guy, I will, you know, I'll pick up my Bible and I'll say, well, you got to remember this, this Bible, it condemns rebels. It tells us in Philippians to beware of dogs. But if we wait on the Lord, we soar up on wings. Like, man, you know, just, uh, well, we could wrap the interview up right now. That, that, everybody that heard that? Compl- complete eisegesis. That That's not what the prophets and the apostles said, but it's, it's fun to think about. Anyway, you know, that's it. You know, Southern Miss, baby, to the top. I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. Back on the football field, I'm still shocked, Coach Bauer. I'll let you go for a summer, but man, you know, he he knows a good man when he sees me. You got to do what you got to do. But but in 03, I mean, what a great season that wound up being, and you become the undeniable starter. What would that mean to be a starter by your sophomore year? So the the May uh, before the summer. Uh, I didn't punt a football. I just worked on technique because I knew Hallman graduated. Um, and uh, shout out to Mark Hallman, third all time on on punting average. Um, he he taught me a lot, and and so he was graduating. So I said, I if, you know this is it. This is it's all coming down to this. And I was in a battle in in uh, two days, and the week of the Cal game, we went out. We started the 03 season at Cal. They came in because we're it's kicking battle too. For Darren McCaleb, it was a snapper battle between a couple guys. And um, and so, yeah, they, I remember they came in, came upstairs. It was Latrell Pollard. He you know, pulled us out one by one, told us who had won the – and so we didn't know to like the week of game week, but it was just like, oh, wow. I'm not only like on the team for the third year in a row, but like I'm starting for like my childhood team. This isn't like, oh, uh, Southern Miss was an opportunity. So, you know, it's just like this is my team, dude. Like, hey. like when I was a when I was a, a kid in elementary school, surrounded by Mississippi State and Ole Miss fans, like, like this is it. Like, this is my life is at twenty if it can come full circle, you know. And and I'm able to 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 play for my childhood team, so it was a dream come true. Oh, that had to be. And one cool thing about the punter position at Southern Miss, it, it's unique. I mean, the name Ray guys involved here, so you know, big big shoes to live up to, and, and you're right up there by the time you finish in the same breath with everything you did. So the punter position is well-known at Southern Miss. But but getting on to this season, and, and I just want to get to one moment, if you don't mind, and then we'll plug in any other ones you want because it's your show. But, man, that TCU game, to me, the biggest moment ever at the Rock. I mean, they're undefeated, playing for the conference championship, top 10 TCU, I mean, win 40 to 28, and the goalposts come down. What did that night mean to you? It was wild. It was the third time that year we had played on on uh, Thursday night. So it was yeah. the now check this out. It was the third time that season that Tarico Corso Herb Street and Doctor Jerry Punch had had like shown up. We were the we were the national game for the third time. First game we we beat UAB in a close one. Second game we got really hammered by Nebraska. That you know that was that was a tough one. And Dustin had had a bad game that that night. And so. We got on this winning streak, you know. We'd have won four in a row, and here comes TCU, and you know the BCS, and they're going they're going to bust the BCS. And I can remember that morning waking up. We were at Hathorn Suites in Hattiesburg. Used to be Hathorn Suites, and Corso's down there getting eggs, you know. And <laughs> then you're on the side, you come out of Eagle Walk, and you you're, you're walking, in, and there's like dudes with orange bowl jerseys on, and you're like, oh wow, like we are, like we're the we're the game. And, and so nobody believed that we could win that game. Um, but it was a defensive lineman we had named Eric Scott, and he had got he had banged up his ankle the week before. And dude, him and Todd McCall like lived that week in the training room, and that was an epitome of like how much we thought that we could win that game. Um, that night, particularly, uh, Dustin hits Deron Lawrence early. Uh, defense is playing lights out. I mean, on, on my punt team that year, Marchant, just to put it in perspective, eight or. N- so, so not counting me, even though I went to a, a an NFL camp, nine I think, nine of the guys that played in that game that were punt protection for me went to to NFL camps, um, <laughs> and that that defense was just on fire that night. I, I, one thing some people don't know: this, you say it's the biggest game at the Rock, the loudest the Rock ever got. TCU got back in that game. They did a couple of hokey onside kicks. So it was like four minutes left, something like that. And they've got the ball like the 25. And Tyrone call, Tyrone Nix calls Greg a, a, a corner blitz from the blind side from Greg Brooks. 
Anybody said, knows defense, that was a gutsy call, you know, in that situation. The quarterback Rod's there. out there, and Rod mm-hmm. gets the signal, and Rod looks back like this because he didn't. He thought he got the signal wrong, and Todd, you know, does it again, and so he brings GB off the side. And Nathan Stewart came off the edge, and Nathan shook the back like that, and he the back went inside, and GB got him. And when the ball came out, like I think it was louder at that moment than it was after we won the football game. But I remember like thinking, like, as, and the the it started ticking down. Bully tackles their quarterback, you know, and the and everybody sprints on the field. And I'm just like, we did it. It was one of those moments where you were like, everything came together. It was just like. Everything that you put in as a player, um, and I mean, I mean, I'm just a punter. I'm not talking about like what Dustin and the offense did. Hey, look, hey, I'm the first say it's special and, teams, offense, defense, yeah, no different. We had, we had a good night that I mean, night. <laughs> we, we made we made Sports Center top ten on a couple of plays on on the punt team, I think. But but that was it was rewarding because like everybody's on the field, young people, old people. My helmet got lost halfway through. People are screaming, and it was just like a collective like family celebration. People are like. Yeah, this is what Southern Miss does. Um, and, you know, probably, like you said, that was probably probably the greatest moment, uh, one of the gr- top two greatest moments ever, you know, in a Southern Miss uniform. Oh, man, incredible setup, incredible story right there. And the way that finished, the goalpost came down. What a special night that you were a and part it of. Us, it. it took us like 15 minutes to get the goalpost down, but we, but we got it down. And then, I, I, and then I, it went I, down I, I, can, I can picture the guys, you know, a lot of this movement, a lot – like, I'll keep going, and then finally it came down. I remember. That's awesome, man. And, uh, but they came down no matter how they got down. What a big night, man. And, and, and you had a big year, your sophomore year, even outside of the, that, that game. You had a 76-yard punt at the Rock, which is the longest of all time. How in the world do you kick a ball that long? I've tried to punt the ball. I'm, I'm just not built for punting, man, my legs. How? How? You kick a well, it, was, it was one of the longest. It was one of the longest at the Rock. Ray Ray's got the record. Ray kicked like a ninety three against Ole Miss. But oh yeah, ninety three. But that one was was up there. Is it? Exactly it, was, it was at Ole Miss. Yeah, it was at Ole Miss. At Ole Miss. Yeah, but I'm trying to keep up Miss. with all your stats, man. But, that was yeah, a road in, in the, game in the Rock. Um, yeah, it That's was right. Ray uh, kicked that long one. We were playing South Florida. Um, it was a big game for us. We were three and three. Early in the game, Seth Cumbie blocks a, a field goal. Rod scoops and scores it, and that's when the season changed that year. But yeah, that was uh, I, I can remember that one, man. I was uh, balls on the balls on the twenty-two, and we were kicking towards the the field house. So we were kicking um, away. F- uh, my back was to the the bowl now, and uh, I, I hit it. It was it was it wasn't a huge high punt. It was it was a missile, and it went over the dude's head, and it. So I kicked it from about like the 15, like at my block point, and it went to like the other 18, and then it rolled like the last 15 yards, and I think like Rod downed it on the two. So not only was it like a bomb, like we got them inside like the five-yard line. So, you know, it was one of those moments where you hit them in practice, and you're like, man, I wish I could do that in a game. But, yeah, when you hit that one, you're just like, oh, wow, yeah, finally all came together. So, And it's one of those moments where – uh, I think I think Coach Bauer gave me the next week like the big hit of the game, and I was like, I didn't hit anybody. But uh, it it's those moments where your teammates like see and appreciate what you do, you know. Um, and and it's it's kind of moments like that where you get street cred with your brothers. Yeah, and I got caught up in the TCU moment. I, I just tied that at the Rock. That was a road game. No disrespect to the great Ray guy. Hey, the only but, uh, the only time, by the way, that I got to to meet Ray uh, when I was still playing. Oh yeah, tell me a Ray guy story, man. We, guy. we hung out. We hung out uh, and, and talked some after I left. But in 04, we're playing Cincinnati. They're retiring his jersey, and it's right before half. Uh, I got a punt like partially blocked. I can't. I don't remember if it was my fault or protection or whatever, but it was partially blocked. And I'm running to the sideline, and I see Ray Guy and his family. It's like two minutes before halftime. And I said, I am not about to meet Ray Guy under, like, this circumstance. I am so embarrassed, <laughs> like, at the greatest of all. So I, like, ran down the sideline away from him and then and, and never never interacted with him at all. I was, like, super embarrassed. Oh, shoot. Good story right there. But, but, but man, just Ray, Ray Guy's on your side. How cool is that, man? You got Ray Guy stories. Um 
But, yeah, what a year you wind up having for your first year starting. I mean, second in Conference USA in punting yards uh, that year. Did, did really great things for your first year. You guys wind up making the Liberty Bowl, too. Conference USA champs, tough loss to a really good Utah team. But an interesting thing happened, man, in that Liberty Bowl. You made the college uh, football all-bowl team, and you also were the Liberty Bowl MVP. Now, that's an uncommon MVP for a punter to be, but that's how good you were. But, man, when you got that MVP trophy for the Liberty Bowl, how'd that make you feel? Well, it was uh, it, it, they, they gave out two. And so they gave out a defensive and an offensive. So after the game, somebody comes to me and Rod, and they say, hey, uh, they want you in the press tent. Okay, so we get on the back of this golf cart, and they say, hey, uh, Rod, you're the – most valuable defensive player, Luke. You're the most valuable. I was like, I was like, dude, I'm an, I'm a defensive position. Like, like, how's that supposed to work? But yeah, they give you this trophy. It's like bigger than a you know Mississippi State championship trophy. <laughs> Rick, Rick Cleveland had the best line. This was in the Claren Ledger the next day, and it was, you know, we got shut out. Uh, Urban Meyer was the head coach. Kyle Whittingham was the DC. Uh, Dan Mullen was the quarterbacks coach. I mean, Utah, Alex Smith was the quarterback. I mean, they, they were really good, man. They, that, they was really the, good. that was the year before they went to the Fiesta. They went yeah. to the Fiesta next year. So, he uh, – Rick Cleveland wrote, he said, you know, how how tough, you know, was the offense for Southern Miss, you know, how they had a bad day and how bad was it. And then this is the quote. The media sarcastically selected Southern Miss punter Luke Johnson as the offensive MVP. And I was like, oh, man. Can no, I, I don't, yeah. man, you deserve that sarcasm, my butt. You got to, I mean, <laughs> it was a good game, you know, but I punted like eight times. It was like a 40 something, 45 yard average or so. And so I had a really good game, but it, I didn't want a really good game. I wanted us to, to dominate on offense. I didn't have to play, but it happened. Yeah, about, a, about a month or so ago, I actually watched that whole game again, man. And yeah, you were on the field quite a bit, but it was a deserved award, man. Great job. Did your best. What can you do? You know, offense just wasn't moving the ball that day. So, but real quick, you made an impact real fast on your sophomore year at Southern Miss, but a little off the field stuff, man. I mean, like I said, you're just such a good dude, especially back then on and off the field. I mean, you did countless hours of community service. I mean, you, you had won numerous scholar athlete awards while you were at Southern Miss. I mean, how did you find time? You're, you're a pastor, man. I mean, how do you, preacher, how do you do all this at that, at that point, being a D1 athlete? So, yeah, back in the day, um, you know, I had, had a real good support system, of course, with academics. Um, you know, Miss Stacy and Miss Miss Tracy did a great job with us. Christy Pierce um, with us and compliance. And, you know, so we, we had a good academic um, saying. But, I mean, you know, in high school, my mom and dad and elementary pushed me for academics. And, you know, I, I was I, – I did good in academics. So, it was one of those things where this is why I'm at – this is why I'm at school – even though we all know Marchant that we're there, you know, reason number uh, two, we're there to play football. Reason number one, we're there to uh, <laughs> the famous <laughs> academic meetings. Yeah. yeah. Now, now it's I'm there to get NIL, right? I mean, that, yeah. that, but uh, back then, yeah, it was school first, football second. Exactly right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you just kind of you, you got to learn balance in life. And I, I had a lot of buddies at the BSU, you know, I play a lot of ping pong at the BSU and. But it was it was just about like getting into a routine of life and taking care of what needs to be taken care of. And at that time, when I and so in in the at the end of the summer of two thousand three, that's when I quit serving at the church in Ellsville, and I just basically started traveling a lot, uh, especially in the off season. And so um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things you hit the grind, you do what you need to do, and and uh, how I how I tried to balance my time then has really helped now. Um, you know, with, with all the crazy stuff that I got, I could probably got way too much going on right now, but it, it's one of those things that you, you know, you enjoy doing. And when you're able to, to impact people and you're able to pour into people's lives, I mean, it, it's worth it, whatever, you know, it, it takes and however you have to, you know, manage your schedules. Yeah. Being a D1 athlete and as good as you are too, and doing all the community service, keeping your grades so high. I mean, that's a full bucket. And, and I was even telling my wife, Angela, when I was looking up all your stuff, I'm like, look at all what he does right now, even. And we'll get into all that. But like, does, does Luke sleep? And anything he's got to deal with Kelly Santa or an Eagle Hour too. Like, how does he do all this? Man? So, but good stuff, man. Kudos to you handling all that. But, but back on the football field, your junior year. So, I mean, you're just the solidified starter. I mean, already making a big name for yourself. And, and here's another big game for you, man. We're opening up the season at Nebraska. 
and they hadn't lost but seven home games prior to that in the last 16 years. So it's a big challenge for you guys. And I'll let you set the stage for the rest, man. But what a day over there in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was a day. Um, it was an 11 o'clock game. It was a national broadcast on ABC. And I remember, like, we had played in big environments. But Nebraska is just a different animal. And, and that was still when they were coming off the Osborne days. That was Bill Callahan's – for second game, I think it was our opening game, but it was his second game as head coach. And um, yeah, just the fans were were crazy cool. I came off; I'd done an interview with a with a Lincoln newspaper earlier in the week, so I like I came off the field like from from pregame, and like there was like a family there, and they wanted me to sign like the the newspaper. And then you know later in the game, we get like a standing ovation. And I remember talking to the guy that was leading us out on the field. I was like, "Man, why are y'all so nice?" And he's like. It's not like this down in the South. And I was like, bro, you have like no idea, man. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that and and playing in that environment, a lot of people don't realize like a lot of their fans are in the end zone, so the sound compresses. And it was probably the loudest place that, that I'd ever played. Um, Nasty Bunch forced five turnovers, had a huge stop at the end. Uh, we got a pick six. Darren hit three field goals. Dustin hit an amazing pass to, to Marvin Young. And so right at the end of the game, like we we hold them and all got to take like two knees. So I go, I can't remember if it was Terrence Ford or somebody, but we go and we get the water cooler because we're about to douse Coach Bauer. And and somebody comes up and says, Don't do that. It was a staffer said, Don't do that. He doesn't want he doesn't want uh, water. He doesn't want that. Do not do that. So we put it down. So we're jumping up and down when the cloud, uh, when the when when the clock runs out. And I remember hearing Bauer yelling. He was like, "Act like you were supposed to win. Let's go. Act <laughs> like you were supposed to win." And so you know, it was just business. So after the game, the ABC sideline guy, you know, says, uh, "Coach Bauer, this is uh, you know, this has got to be one of the best wins of your career." And he's like. Just to be honest, like we really expected to win this game, like just total nonchalant. No, that, that is so funny. I talk to Coach Barr all the time, and I've told him that that one twice in the past four months. I'm glad you filled in the blanks for that because he's taken aback. The reporters even saying like an upset. The hell, we've been doing this all the time. What he said, <laughs> and so and so he said and in that same interview. He goes, "Yeah, we came over here like four years ago, and we we turned it over, and we should have won." He's like, "We really expected to win this." And I was like, "That's my coach, man." But yeah, he 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 wanted us to celebrate and enjoy it, but he didn't want us to act like that. You know, we weren't supposed to do this, and that was probably the the best road experience. And and man, those Nebraska fans, Marchant, and you experienced it when. You, you've seen it. When we walked out, like, they gave us a standing ovation. And I, I never saw it anywhere else. Yeah, I've talked to so many Southern Miss fans that were there and, and players, and they said they were just the most hospitable and just unbelievably gracious fans for somebody to come in there, being only the eighth time they lost in the last 16 years, to come in there and beat them. I mean, they're like, you know, best team won. So, yeah, I've heard nothing but great things about Nebraska fans. And, man – what a huge way to start that season. Any other junior year moments you want yeah, to share? At the, end of, at the end of that season, it was wild. Um, Aaron Rodgers and Cal came to the Rock. That's right. And this is, there was so much riding on this game. In, in 01, because we lost to TCU, we busted the BCS, okay? It was Nebraska went to the national championship game because of the BCS, da, da, da. 03, we jack up the BCS because of TCU. 04 – Cal is supposed to go to the Rose Bowl. And they come in and they got J.J. Arrington and Aaron Rodgers and Marshawn Lynch. And, man, like we played we, – we balled that game. Um, Texas actually sent their managers te – Texas managers were there. And they were cheering for us in the upset. Um, this is probably one of the, the most embarrassing moments in my athletic career. Johnny Eubanks gets a big punt return. Uh, Dustin sneaks it in, and all we got to do, we got kicked the PAT. We're tied with like five minutes left. PAT gets blocked, um, and Darren tries to grab the guy and, and can't get him, and I start running. And, dude, in one moment, that's the fastest I've ever run in my entire life. Like, it's probably like a four or five guy, and he's going down the sidelines, 
and here's 240 pound Luke Johnson, and I'm tracking with him like the whole way. So about the 25 yard line, my body just basically inside said, I quit. Well, I saw it on my peripheral that there was this cow guy there, and I started fading into him. But what I did was Ray, Ray, uh, Wayne Hardy, Wayne Hardy was coming right behind me. And he was a hit have caught him because Wayne was way faster than me. And so what I didn't realize was I set a pick on Wayne and they ended up scoring two points on it. And anyway, we, we ended up we ended up losing that game. Um, but what was funny was after the game, we're going up shaking everybody's hands. Hey, play well in the Rose Bowl, play, you know, good luck and all that. Well, because we played them so close, Texas jumped them in the BCS and they went to the Texas went to the Rose Bowl and Cal went to the holiday. So it was like three out of four years we jacked up the BCS. Oh, what what a story right there. But, yeah, I remember that game. I mean, and obviously Aaron Rodgers, the career he went on to have. And I heard Cal players, too, say that was the loudest environment they had heard all year. And, and I mean, people understand. That's why it's like, God, I wish we could get some more fans even when times are down because it's just the way the Rock's built. It's up. You know, that yeah. noise comes down. So, but uh, what great moments that you're already having at the Rock right there. And uh, you guys wind up getting to the New Orleans Bowl that year. Playing in the Superdome against North Texas and win that game. How, how was that bowl game experience for you? It was fun. I mean, uh, for a lot of guys on our team, you know, they got to play in front of their family. And, you know, for us staying in, in the Big Easy for a week, that was fun. A uh, little little funny story. I'll be quick. But on game day, you know how kickers, we don't have uh, punters, we don't have uh, meetings. So me and McCaleb and Stephen Daigle and Britt Barefoot, we go down to Cafe Dumont and we're, you know, we eat beignets and we're walking on the river walk and, we go down the steps and we're standing right there across from Artillery Park, Jackson Square, and uh, the river's up. And I slip, and dude, I'm going in the river like I'm about to fall in. <laughs> you fell in the Mississippi River, <laughs> and, and Barefoot comes behind me and grabs me and pulls me back. And the joke is, I'm like, Brent, if you'd have let me go in, dude, you'd have played that night because he was my backup. And I said, <laughs> but yeah, like the things you know, you know, people don't know, you know what what goes on. But yeah, that was, but that was uh, getting to play in the Superdome. We got to play twice that year because we played Tulane at home and. Man, such a such a cool place to play, and we we showed up that game, blew out North Texas. We were mad all week. They got camcorders as their bowl gift, and we got like a bunch of clothes. You know, I'm cool with swag, but um, but I think I think yeah, yeah, started, yeah, the little handheld recorders they got they got handheld record. I mean, back then it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Big yeah. deal. We got we got clothes, but we like our clothes. But anyway, yeah, that was that was a fun way to cap that season. We we felt like because we got up to 21 that year. Um, and then we dropped some down the stretch. So we felt like that bowl game was a, was a good way to end it. That was Bowley's senior year, Cash's senior year. And uh, that was a that was a real good squad, too. Yeah, yeah, real, real good squad. And what was great right there, just those Southern Miss winning ways, that's the 11th straight winning season for Southern Miss. I mean, you're just carrying on that winning tradition. And and speaking of the guy leading a lot of that stuff and all those winning ways, Fedora took over some at the end there, was, was Coach Jeff Bauer. guy means a lot to me and you. How was it being coached by Jeff Bauer? I don't think we all realize, realized at the time. We realized it to an extent. I don't think we realized at the time that we were being coached by a legend. Um, because when when he's the only guy you got when you don't play JUCO, you know, you, you don't you don't have anything to go off of. I mean, I went to West Jones. I played for 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 Mike Taylor. I mean, three hour, three and a half hour practices were the norm. So I came to Southern Miss and we're practicing two hours. Like Coach Bauer, awesome, you know. But I'm I'm saying that hard nose stuff that I learned over Coach Taylor, and he was a great coach and 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 loved me and encouraged me. And so when you get get that at the college level, you just think, hey, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it is. And I don't. And and now you know, seeing how things have changed, and just seeing how thing you hear stories after you get out about how it was at other places, and you just say, man, like. We we didn't realize, you know, what we had. We realized a little at the moment. Because here's the deal with Coach Bauer. When you're a freshman, you're like, you're like scared to death of it. When you're, was a red shirt freshman, <laughs> yeah. when you're a redshirt freshman, you're still like mortified. When you that third year, whether you're a true junior or redshirt sophomore, you're like, wow, there, there's something, there's there's something pretty incredible here. When you're a junior, you're like, this man loves me. And this man has my best in mind. And when you're a senior, what I even found out as a senior is he would actually, he, I mean, he would open up to us. And there were some things that, like, he would, he would add, we had player reps and seniors, like, he would get our seniors together and he would say, How do we want to deal with this situation as a football team? And the respect that he showed you 
with his football proudness and the leader that he was. I mean, you you never got into a situation where you were halfway concerned that Coach Bauer didn't know what to do. I mean, you never felt that. And I, I guess to sum it up, man, we just didn't realize what we had at the time. And looking back now, I mean, he's a legend. I mean, there, there was he would not he would not it would have been my college experience would have been a thousand times different had I not played for Jeff Bauer. If you want to break the rock. You need to make yourself indestructible. If you want to play between the hedges, you need to work out there, up there, down there, everywhere. If you want to reach the win bar, you need to lose sleep, lose count. You need to play every game like you got nothing to lose. Like I said, you, you're just – kind of get back to you. You're just such a good dude. You win another good award, get some recognition where you get the American College Football Association good works team, if I'm wording that correctly, trying to get the whole thing out. But, man, what that mean to you? Because that's, that's a lot of – they're recognizing you doing a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, we, had a, we had an SID named Mike, Mike Montero. He's at West Virginia now. And Mike would always say, hey, I'm putting you up for this. I'm putting you up for this. And I was like, okay, man, whatever. It's cool. But, yeah uh, – the, my junior year, my summer of my junior year, Coach Bauer let me go to Africa. I served in Burkina Faso as a missionary. Uh, we lived in the bush. Uh, we didn't have we didn't have any running water. We pumped everything out of a well, and we literally would go house to house, share the gospel, and love on people. And we worked with with African brothers and sisters in the faith, and and just shared the gospel. And and uh, I think some of that award came from Southern Miss. Like, hey, we got this dude, and he spent all summer like in the sub Sahara, and he's a starter, and but yeah, you know, Mike would Mike would just always say, "Hey man, like there's an opportunity, you know, I'm gonna, I'm going to nominate you for this." And so for me it was always communicating, "Hey guys, it's good works, but like it's not me, man. Like like naturally in and of myself, I wouldn't desire to do these things. Like Christ changed my heart. Christ gave me love for people. Uh Christ has called me to to serve people and so, you know, the very fact that I would get the get put into opportunities by the Lord and by other people to do good works. Ephesians 2.10 says that when, when Jesus saves somebody, he, he has already prepared good works for them to walk in. And uh, so, so that's just kind of the way I viewed it. I had those opportunities um, through the Lord's grace and providence. And, and uh, so, yeah, I took it as a privilege, you know? And, and so when you get, when you get like, you know, when you get awarded for that, it's just kind of like, man, there's like so many more people doing like way greater stuff than I'm doing. And they don't get recognized for it. So let me not just like walk around and say, hey, I'm somebody because I'm not. You know, it's an opportunity to to be humble and to brag on the Lord and, and just to look for other ways to serve people and not get recognized for it. No, you're a very humble, man, but you definitely deserve that kind of recognition. I was a D1 athlete and to watch somebody like you might have been my teammate to do everything you were doing, man, that, that deserves a little recognition, Luke, and you got it. And uh, so – Getting into your senior year, I mean, you're at this point one of the best punters in America, clearly, but something big happens. And I'm a New Orleanian, something really hitting home, hitting a lot of people I know. And Katrina, you know, hits before the football season. And, you know, Hattiesburg's a hop, skip, and a jump away. And Hattiesburg got impacted the Gulf Coast. Man, you're ready for your season or your senior year, and then that happens. How, how did you guys – handle it? How'd you handle it? I mean, walk me through the process of Katrina. Yeah, it was tough. You know, we, we wrote it out. Um, we, you know, we, we kind of wrote it out. I think the night before a bunch of us like slept in the field house, but it didn't hit, mm -hmm. it hit, you know, the next day. So we wrote, I wrote it out on my apartment uh, off of, off of 49. And right after, I mean, uh, one of my teammates, he was on uh, his parents' house on, I think it was uh, Southampton right off Hardy street. And, we had to go get him out and, you know, and, and you make you're trying to make contact with coaches, but nobody's cell phones working. And, you know, it was like two, two days, uh, they were bowling hot dogs outside the commons. That's how we ate. So coach Bauer had it set up where, cause it was the week before we played Tulane. Well, that game's, you know, obviously canceled. So we got it. We had a plan together. Everybody went home for a couple of days and then showed back up <clears throat> and they took us to Memphis. And, um, I remember on the way up, I always rode right behind Coach Bauer. He was in the front right. I was always behind him. In the, uh, and he just leaned back to me. He's like, hey, when we get to Memphis, I want you to do a devotion. And so we went to we went to Memphis, and um, 
University of Memphis let us use their facilities. We stayed in a hotel for like 10 days. ESPN followed us around. And and I just remember like that was an opportunity. And we people were, you know, it was in some ways, you know, we were we were all trying to like express things. People had some emotions that had been bottled up because like we, we were on I 55, man. And we get to like north of Jackson. We stop at a Western Sizzling. It's the first hot meal we've eaten in like four days. We get to the, the hotel and dudes are turning on the TV and they're like, hey, man, that's my grandma's house. I mean, it was like, you know, like looking at New Orleans East and the West Bank. And, and and so there was a lot of emotion that came out during those 10 days. I mean, some of it was good. Some of it was bad. You know, those times were, were you know, I, I was mad at people and people were mad at me and all this stuff. And but we bonded. We we bonded really well. Um the 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 toughness forced us to to uh to cling to each other because you know nobody had family. I mean, we were we were family. And so it was a unique opportunity for us as seniors to basically say we've got to lead in the middle of this. And I don't think like we had some big senior meeting, you know, but it was just kind of like you look at the guys around that came in together and you just say, hey, hey like it's on us, man. Like we, we got to get through this and we've got to show these guys how to how to get through it. And so it, it was a wacky year because it forced the, – the season got backloaded. Um, you know, we played like th- – we played like four games in like 14 days. It was something insane. Mm-hmm. We played four straight games. On, or it was, No, it was three games in 12 days. We played four straight games on the road. Um, you know, we lost like four games that year by combined like 12 points or something. Mm-hmm. Three games. It was, it was crazy. But – the last game of the season, we were five and five. The the winning streak was on the line. Two lane game. Everybody else had gone out as we're doing senior day. Dustin gets us all. Uh, Dustin Allman gets us all in the locker room, and he just starts going around. And Eubanks is there. The Cully twins are there. T Ford's there. You know, we're all there. Uh, and he just goes around, just telling us, you know, that he loves us. He's there for us. And 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 that's the first time that year it hit us. All right. We got 60 minutes to keep this thing going. <laughs> like we got we we got to we got to keep this thing going and you know we did we won that day but yeah the whole that whole season was trying to figure out how to lead in like the craziest of circumstances. Yeah, wow, and you guys kept that winning streak alive and, and like I said leading into that season you're come one of the best punters in America and the stats proved that you were number 1 in conference USA in punting yards, number 7 nationally in punting yards. And when you talk about seven, who's number one, two, three, four, five, I mean, it's points, decimal points on who's better. So let's call you the best punter in America because you bleed black and gold, baby. Let's do that. But but For speaking sure. of the two-lane game, man, what a way to wrap it up. I know it's senior day, but, man, you're the love of your life, Lauren. You do something that's probably the ultimate romantic move that you could do as a Southern Miss football player, man. To, Tell everybody what you did. <laughs> well, I was supposed to do it the week before. We were playing Memphis. It was a cold Saturday night. Uh, I had close to like a 48-yard average. I hit five touchbacks. I threw a pass. But we didn't get my onside kick with a minute left. And so I had this thing planned out. I had a propo- the proposal planned out. And I scrapped it at the last second. And uh, Lauren never knew. So the next week, all week long, because everybody knew that I was going to propose. Like, all the all my teammates, everybody knew I was going to propose. So, this next week, they were like, hey, dude, what if we lose? And I was like, she ain't getting a ring. And so, later on, Coach Bauer <laughs> What, were you going to do it in a basketball game maybe or something? I don't know. <laughs> but Coach Bauer was on with John Cox, and he was like, he's like, man, we were all under, like, pressure. He's like, we got to get Luke to propose. So, it was raining a little that, that game. The ring, Sean Fayard was a, a an athletic trainer. And I gave – it was, it was, the ring was in a case and then it was in like that cardboard, like covering. And I gave it to Sean and I said, you're in charge of this thing. And dude, he put it in his fanny pack and he, all the game long, he's running back and forth, he's taping guys up and that rings in his fanny pack. So I had it set up <laughs> right there, uh, with the athletic department. They bring a camera and of course sideline would come up and they'd have a microphone and it'd go up on the screen. So with about a minute left, we, you know, we, we won 26, seven, something like that. And uh, Coach Bauer grabs me, and he goes, all right, you ready to do this? Yes, sir. He's like, I got to go shake Coach Shelfo's hand. Do not do it until I get over there. Don't do wow. it until <laughs> I get over there. 
That's powerful. So the game just wrapped up. The first thing on his mind is this proposal. Yeah, it's Coach Bauer for you. I love it. So he's it. like, don't do it till I get over there. And so <laughs> Lauren meets me on the field. She still doesn't know what's going on. The PA, PA goes, uh, I think it's Jackson Walker. He's direct your attention to the 35-yard line. And so I don't realize it, but Lauren's out there. And, and I start talking to her, and I don't realize it, but, like, a bunch of my teammates, like, made this circle. And I tell her why I love her, you know, and all this. And then I get on my knee and I propose. Everybody starts going crazy, and she says yes. And, you know, the rest That's is awesome. history. But – I had told her earlier in the year, Marshan, I was like, hey, uh, you know, you know, I like, I like you a lot, and I think we have a future together, but Darren's been making me play, like, way too much golf, so I don't think I have enough money to do it, to buy a ring this year. So she had no idea that it was coming. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah, Co- Coach Bauer was there, teammates were around, and the Coach Bauer ended up coming to our wedding, and, you know, it was just really cool, man. Really cool. Oh, man, what a, what a story right there, man. You, you're a man of faith. You're one heck of a punter. And, man, you are in an endless romantic with a proposal like that, man. You know, you got a lot of guys out there maybe might be watching this, hearing about this, got a, got a lot to think of to match that for a proposal, man. I mean, anybody think of doing it at a Chili's? No, no, no. Step up step up your game, please. Luke, Luke did it big time. Luke did it right. So, But congratulations there, man. So that, that's awesome. 17 what a story. Years, no. Yeah, 17 years this year. Yeah, 17. 17. There you go. Yeah, because I saw you by 17. So good, good for y'all, man. Awesome. What a couple. Black and gold couple made in heaven. Um, but it's not over yet. It's over at the Rock. You know your time there. You got one more game, the New Orleans Bowl against Arkansas State and being played in Lafayette, Louisiana, which was interesting because of Katrina. But, man, were you soaking in that those moments? It's just this last time dressed in the black and gold and in a bowl game, which is super cool. Yeah, it was unique. Um, it was different, you know. Uh, it was it was different than a normal bowl game just because they had to move it. Rick Cleveland um, shattered me some that week, and it was writing a story about me during that time. Every Tuesday night, I'd go to the Forest County Jail, and I would I would hang out with inmates, preach to them, do Bible study, uh, and I'd been doing that for a few years. So so Rick shattered me, and and uh, I got to – That was a that was a cool week because he was asking me stuff and I was sharing him stuff. And so it was a cool week, like to remember, you know, what my career had been about. Um, I didn't mention this, but it, it came out. Um, one of those memories that came back was at the end of the 03 season, because I was a walk on back in the day, we didn't sign kickers. McCaleb was, you know, probably the first specialist that we had signed in quite some time. I can remember after the East Carolina game, we had won the conference championship, getting ready for the Liberty Bowl. Coach Bauer would do what he always did. He'd take a, he'd take a ball and it signed by the whole team because we're always signing footballs for whatever. And he says, hey, this is one of my favorite things to do. And he would read off your stats. When he started reading off my stats, everybody knew it was me. So he said, it's my opportunity and my privilege to present a full athletic scholarship to Luke Johnson. You know, everybody, Luke, you know. And the whole team stands up, claps, and, you know. So, so what I'm saying is during that – during that week, the bowl game in 05, that was one of those memories that I was like, here, I'm a kid from in between Laurel and Soso, Mississippi. I've been a Golden Eagle my whole life. I walked on to my team. My coach believed in me. I won a job. He put me on scholarship. And I get to finish it like playing three straight bowl games, three straight, you know, winning seasons. And so Rick, like being around me that week, allowed me to kind of relish and remember and sink in like, you know, what that game meant. And uh, just one of those times you get to play, you know, you get to play one more time with your guys. You're not playing for a national championship, but you get to strap it up one more time and and uh, enjoy it. So that, it was it was cool. It was it was a unique situation, but you know, one more game we got to do it. Oh wow, look, I mean, on top of all these great stories of faith, community service, and endless romantic kicking the ball, you know, half a mile. I mean, the walk on story, earning the scholarship fits in there too, man. So it's just incredible everything you did as a Golden Eagle. And yeah, you went out on top, winning that bowl game 31 19. And and then speaking of on top, man, you know, your senior year, you want to be in on several All American teams, first team all conference. You end your career second to Ray Guy with 42.7, almost 43 yard punting average, man. I mean, you just did so much. I mean, looking back at everything. It was a lot. What are you most proud of of your time at Southern Miss? Um, I think I, t- I think I told you this earlier today. We we're talking on the phone. Probably the fact that uh, being voted a team captain. Um, a you know punters don't get that award that often. Um, but 
I think it spoke to the fact that guys respected me as a person first and foremost, and they were then they respected what I did. Um, there were times, you know, that, that we had to lead in hard ways. There was times that we had to, you know, encourage guys. There were times we had to call guys out. There were times where, um, you know, you, at the time you wonder, am I just, you know, am I too vocal? You know, how, how can I, as a punter be vocal? You know, I mean, how can I during sprints, like, you know, Hey man, let's meet time. And like, dude, you didn't do anything today. Oh, I, I mean, Luke, uh, you're, you're a solid dude, man. You could have played linebacker. Come on, yeah, let's but, call you. People you, you understand. Yeah. So, so when you're leading at the time, you're just like, am I just, you know, is this even resonating? And then, you know, how they vote on team captains, like, you know, they you mark a box or you write a name down. And so when they named that at the end of the year, it was kind of like, oh, wow, you know, what, who, who you are as a dude, I mean, it resonates with people. Um, and so I, that was probably the, the biggest accomplishment because that's one of those things. That's that's a permanent deal, man. Not just that you get to walk out for a game and, you know, call heads or tails, but the fact that at the end of the year, after everything's done, guys say, hey, those were our leaders. And it was an honor. It's an honor to be in that, you know, that fraternity of, of Southern Miss team captains. Heck yeah, man. That's the biggest honor you can get if you ask me being team captain. So kudos on an incredible career. I, I try to keep up with all your stats and all your awards, doing all the homework. And you won another award, a very prestigious award at the end of the, your career, the Woody Hayes Scholar Athlete Award, man. That's a big deal. I mean, anybody that doesn't know that one, what would that one mean to you? So that was pretty cool. They, they named it after the legendary Ohio State coach. They would name one, one uh, guy and one girl from each division. So division one, division two, division three. And so uh, I was the division one male winner. And so uh, they flew me and my parents to Columbus and a big banquet. Uh, you know, we got a private tour of Ohio stadium, and, which I was, you know, hoping that we get to go back next year, but I totally understand. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm actually current state. I'm fine with the Kentucky game. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm okay. With it. But, uh, you know, we got a tour of Ohio stadium and, you know, you got to see a bunch of stuff, but yeah, just, uh, just to say, hey, that was cool. You know, there's a whole lot of guys that play D1 sports, but it was a recognition of, like, athletic accomplishment, academic accomplishment, and, like, service community. So it was kind of all three put together. Oh, yeah. Congratulations on that award because that was a big deal. You even said the, the amount of people that got it. It's a very elite crew, and Luke was one of them. So, and, man, you're so good at punting. You joined another elite crew because not so many people get a chance at this. You get a shot at rookie camp with the Detroit Lions just – your experience in the NFL, how was that? It was it was cool, you know, being a part of, uh, you know, being a part of the draft day experience and leading up to the draft and having teams, you know, work you out and, you know, talk to you and, you know, what's going on in pro day. And then, like, being there on draft day sitting on your couch, you know, in Jones County and, oh, wow, that's not a 601 number. You know, hey, it's, you know, it's the Lions. Anybody talking to you? No, sir. All right, we'll call you back then the next round. You know, round five, please, boom, there it is, you know. And so, uh, you know, I didn't get drafted. I got brought in for Ricky Camp. But just that whole experience of being brought in with the draft picks and the free agents. And I was the punter, and I, I held uh, and worked with Matt Prater, who who is still playing football to this day. He's one of the best kickers ever. We played uh, against each other even in Central Florida. But, yeah, walking in an NFL locker room, man, and, like, looking around and, Oh wow, there's another Johnson on this team. Like, oh, that's my locker. You know, oh wow, where are we? You know, where we're at. So that was one of those things. Um, I, I I see it as a little side, you know, just grace gift from the Lord allowed me to experience that. And to be perfectly honest, I was not at the Lions camp to like make the squad or to play or to get an opportunity to play in the NFL. There were a couple dudes on that team that needed like truth in their life during that week and later on. Um, and, uh, and, and I, that's why I was there. I, I, I'm hundred percent. Now, what was really cool though, Joel Klatt was there too. He's like, you know, the, the Fox analyst now for, for college football calls their big game. He was in camp. And so there's a lot of guys in that camp that, you know, that see what they're doing now. So that was pretty cool to be a part of that. And, uh, oh, this is, this is one more cool story from the lines. So, so Eddie Hicks who played cornerback, He's a he's a, a coach now at LSU. He played cornerback at Southern Miss. His older brother Lamarcus from Clarksdale High School. We came in together. We both walked on together. Well, Mark had to go back to Clark Clarksdale after our freshman year. He went and played JUCO. I think he went to Oklahoma, and then he became All Big Twelve at, at Iowa State. Right? He's in rookie camp with me and the Lions. 
And so we're sitting down um, with the head coach of uh, of the Detroit Lions. We're eating dinner with him, and and he's asking our stories. And he's like, "So you're telling me I got two guys in my camp that walked on together at Southern Miss?" We're like, "Yeah." He's like, "That's awesome." You know, he's talk about, you know, the the track of our careers. That was that was really cool to have a, another Southern Miss guy there uh, that we came in together. Oh, man, that's cool. Yeah, NFL experience, man. Like I said, part of an elite crew right there with great, great stories too, man. And Southern Miss is all over the world, even in Detroit, man. I love it. So, but, you know, we'll, we'll, I want to kind of wrap some stuff up with some stuff even more about you because there's so much to talk about. Man, I had a lot of work to do to get this right. Hopefully I did you justice there. Oh, no, it's great, man. We're having but fun. I'm doing my best here, man. But but you are a deep man of faith. And, and looking at what you do, I kind of joke with, with my wife. I'm like, look what Luke does. How does he find time to do all this? But speaking of faith, you know, currently you're the pastor of Cross Point Ministries. You travel and speak all the time spreading the word. And you do an annual trip to India on a missionary trip. So on, on top of probably other things, Luke, it was so much, man. I don't want to miss any things. I just want your time to shine. And this just what a good man you are and what you do, man, to spread the word. Yeah. So um, I, I serve with, with a few other men on, at our church at Cross Point, Cross Point Community Church and the ministry here. And, and uh, my role, I, I, I preach on Sundays and, and, uh, but I'm mainly sent out by them. I, I spend a lot of times, traveling, preaching, you know, a lot of different places. India came about uh, in 2010. I went to go train some pastors, and I found myself going back to India, and I started meeting guys, traveling with guys, encouraging guys, partnering with guys. And so there came a point where I was spending two to three months in India every year. Uh, we were going in the Himalayas, hiking to, to villages that had never heard the name of Jesus, uh, taking care of orphans, um, doing, you know, planting churches, uh, working with the, uh, theological colleges and, and Bible schools and just training people and just meeting people where they're at. I mean, it's, it's stuff that when you come home, you don't tell your mom about, you know, she gets worried about you. But, yeah, I mean, crossing glaciers and mountain passes and, you know, just going through crazy stuff. And that that's part of my call, too. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I see I, – I thought at one point in my life that I may actually move overseas and that's always still an option the lord can do with me you know what he pleases uh but the work in india has has been really good uh god's blessed and there's a network of of guys and and uh, work and you know we have our own um nonprofit um called valiant call and we use that to uh to help other people and um so so yeah india is, is one of those places i never saw myself you know um you know picking one spot on earth to kind of invest in, but it just happened. And I know you want to talk about this in a minute, but I'm working on a PhD right now. And that's my area of, of research. And uh, I'm, right now I'm working on a, a, a doctor of philosophy from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. I'm working on uh, my discipline is called international missiology. So missiology is the study of mission, meaning what God is doing in the world, what God has been doing to make his name known among all peoples. And of course that centers in Jesus Christ and with him coming and living and dying and, and uh, being buried and raised on our behalf, and dying in our place for our sin. And so missiology then it, it begins to answer this question, how do we uh, reach the world with, with the gospel? So it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, I'm as of yesterday, I turned in my last seminar paper with a bibliography. It was like 61 pages, 62 pages. Um, and I'm taking comps in January, and then I'll start writing my dissertation, which will be, you know, between two and 300 pages. And, uh, man, I'd love, and as part of my ministry, to be able to teach theology or, you know, New Testament or uh, missiology at the undergrad or graduate level, um, you know, probably just as as adjunct or however the Lord leads. But I would love to take take that degree and leverage it in order to help guys in other countries who don't have access to good theological education due to, you know, income or, or opportunities would love to be able to help them, you know, to train up other men as well. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a fun life, man, you know, preaching. And this weekend I got a retreat preaching four times to a bunch of churches and students in, in uh, Macon, Mississippi and, you know, writing and doing Eagle hour. Somebody asked me the other day, Mark Chan, they said, how many, how many tracks, of like, like thinking go through your mind at once. And so I was like, well, you know, my, my personal spiritual life, like following Jesus, 
uh, you know, being a good husband, obviously, you know, those are, but then like, all right, Southern Miss, which at the current time is like, Hey, who are we going to get as a coordinator? Who's going in the portal? Who's, who's, uh, who's coming in? Is Frank or junior coming back? Uh, Hey, uh, basketball. Yeah. Oh, uh, Laurel and West Jones are playing for the state championship. Oh, wow. What am I going to preach this weekend? So it's just like, ah, you know, you just, so it's sometimes you, you go down one train of thought and you're like, Oh, that's stressful. I won't fool with that. All right, let's go down this other one. And, uh, you know, just school. I'm grading for for a couple of professors, and everybody's got stuff going on. But it's just it's it's fun, you know, when you think about you know what you got your fingers all in. Uh, real quick, I told you I'd give you any take in the family side of thing. Anything else you want to update us on, Luke? Anything yeah, just going on? Lauren and I um, celebrated 17 years of marriage. Uh, everything's good. Her parents are doing great. My parents are doing great. And man, we're just really thankful. Christ has been so good to us, and uh, you know, just. The, the fact that, you know, I get I get to talk about my alma mater and, you know, maybe in some ways you and I, you know, with what we do in this area, we we're intense and we got to, you know, try to do our best and because it's an escape for some people. Some people have had a horrible day. Some people are going through crazy economic times or crazy family situation. And for us just to uh, to make known our ignorance about certain things <laughs> as we, you know, we knock around, it's an escape for people. And so. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thankful for that. And I would just say this to any of your listeners, you know, and I might not know you from Adam's house, Cat, but if I can ever serve you, you know, or pray for you, or you need somebody to talk to, or just need somebody to vent to, man, like hit me up on social media and hit up Marchant, you know, and holler at me and would uh, would love to to be able to minister to, to any of your listeners or, or anybody in Southern Miss Nation in that in that way. Oh, great way to put things right there. And, and, and Luke, you had such an incredible career. I mean, such an impact on so many lives not just on the field, but off the field, you know, with your faith. And do you have any direct messages maybe for the Southern Miss fans, maybe a Southern Miss fan who is struggling with this three and nine stuff right now? <laughs> you're, you know, you're either a fan or you're not. And you do not love a place. It, it's like this, you know, bad analogy, because my wife is not a university. She's a person. She's a made in the image of God. She loves Jesus. But – I don't love my wife more because of her better days. I don't love my wife less because of her worst days. I love my wife because who she is. And so if you find yourself loving Southern Miss more when they do well or loving Southern Miss less when they don't do as well, I would question whether or not perhaps you love Southern Miss in the right way. So I love Southern Miss uh, because of the memories that I have there, the people that I met there, uh, the experiences that I met that I had there. And when I walk back on campus, you know, n- nostalgia takes over and I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with people associated with that place. I fell in love with experiences that I had there. And that's what makes me a Southern Miss fan. That's why I like, you know, after, you know, we get beat by Mississippi state, I've got my hat on. I'm Walking around like this, Appalachian State walking around. Now South Alabama, like I, you know, but anyway, you know, it was the the point was, I love the university, regardless of 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 whether it's a, a high or low, and so if if you if you are ecstatic and swag walk when the university is doing well, you've got them to own and continue when you know we're struggling. And it's just, you know, the reason why we celebrated basketball so much last year because it had been tough the previous three years. But to your point, I do think we have a fan base that's just always that we're waiting on something good to happen. And man, when something good happens, we obviously respond. But you just gotta hang in there. Um, if you know, if if we if we struggle in a specific sport, guess what? What gets me through is remembering the the good times. I understand that that seasons change and dynamics change and. You know uh, the scene of college sports changes, but I'll always be grateful for for how I experienced Southern Miss, and and I'll encourage people to remember back, and and that's what gets you through times like this. No, oh, great message right there, man. Boosted my SMTCT spirit, Luke, for sure, man. Great message for everybody. You know, trying to see why do I get fired up by 2024? So, Luke, could get you on the show fast enough. Like I said, what an honor to tell your story. I tried to do my best. There's so much, man. I hope I mixed it all well for you. Hopefully I made you proud. Oh, he's great, Marchant. Love you, man. And, you know, you're one of the guys that I looked up to. Not so fast, Corso. Not so fast. I mean, that, no, that's Southern exactly. Miss. Exactly. Pick against and Southern Miss. I was, I was there in 93 when you were a freshman. 
I was oh. there at Baton Rouge when you were waving the flag. And so, you know, man, it's an <laughs> honor. It's an honor to have you as a friend. It's an honor to, to be on here. And it's, it's just cool for us to be able to talk about Southern Miss. Absolutely. Well, from two guys who bleed black and gold daily, I think it'd be a great idea for both of us to give everybody a big Southern Miss. To the, to the top. top. So that's it for another edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime. And if you are enjoying this show, I'm going to ask you to do something absolutely free and easy to do. And that's just help spread the word of the show. Well, until next time, as always, it's Southern Miss to the top.